When seeking out new and intriguing places to visit, the enchanting city of Madrid is often overshadowed by more popular holiday destinations around Europe, such as Paris and Rome. But take the time to explore the bustling streets and squares of this remarkable city, and you'll soon discover that Spain boasts a capital with as much culture, beauty and history as any other on the continent. Shaped over centuries by long-forgotten empires, there are a multitude of tales just waiting to be told in the fabric of its streets and buildings. From magnificent palaces, fountains and cathedrals, to museums of world renown and the towering edifices of a more modern era, there is certainly no lack of sights to inspire and delight the city traveller. In this portrait of Madrid, you'll have the chance to delve deep into Spain's rich and turbulent past. For, as you'll soon discover, this city has had its fair share of conflict. For those who prefer to enjoy the beauty of the capital without dwelling too much on history, however, you'll find that the delightful Mediterranean climate provides plenty of enchanting spaces where you can simply soak up the atmosphere of Madrid. And there'll also be plenty of time to enjoy the glitz and glamour of the city nightlife with an array of cinemas, theatres and designer shops to choose from as we explore the more contemporary areas of the capital. As daylight breaks, our tour of Madrid will begin far from the clamour of clubs and city traffic as we explore an area which is considered to be the very heart of the old city, Plaza de la Villa. During medieval times, this was a bustling market square, and although nowadays the atmosphere is much calmer than centuries ago, the buildings that overlook the plaza still have plenty of stories to tell. One of the oldest structures in the square, and indeed in the entire city, is the Torre de los Lujanes, which was built in the early 15th century and named after the Lujan family, who resided here for over 200 years. As well as once having a reputation for being the tallest building in Madrid, the architecture of the tower is in the Mudeja style and serves as a reminder of the city's early Arabic roots. Madrid was first founded as a Muslim fortress back in the 9th century, and although the Muslims were eventually driven out of Spain as Christianity swept across the Iberian Peninsula and the Spanish monarchs became more powerful, traces of Islamic influence on the culture of the nation still remain. If we take a look at the later constructions in Plaza de la Villa, you'll find that the style is quite different from the Torre de los Lujanes, however. The city's first town hall is a fine example of 17th century architecture, with its steeple-like towers and dormer windows, and later touches to the exterior include the wonderful Baroque doorways and the romantic balconies, added so that the royal family could stand and watch processions passing through the plaza many centuries ago. Another prominent building in the square is Casa de Cisneros, which was built in 1537 by the nephew of the famed Cardinal Cisneros, who was one of the most powerful men in Spain in the late 15th and early 16th century. Cisneros served twice as regent and introduced many harsh religious reforms to the country, earning him the reputation of a tyrant amongst the Muslim population. Some, in fact, believe he may have been poisoned by his enemies when he died in 1517. But although he didn't live long enough to see his nephew's grand building, he would most certainly have approved of this fine example of early Renaissance architecture. In front of Casa de Cisneros stands another prominent figure in the history of Spain, Álvaro de Bazán. The statue of this great Spanish admiral was brought to the square in 1980, although the subject predates this time by many centuries. Bazan was the man responsible for drawing up the plans for the Armada, which was set to invade England back in the 16th century. At this time, Spain was one of the world's greatest empires, controlling territory which stretched from the Americas to the islands of Southeast Asia. But the Spanish king, Philip II 
was also eager to include Great Britain in the nations he reigned over. Bazin, like his king, became an advocate of war. Alas, his plans for the Great Spanish Armada would amount to nothing when the ships of Elizabeth I destroyed the fleet before it reached British shores. Alvaro de Bazin is nonetheless considered a national hero, remembered in this wonderfully detailed sculpture dominating the plaza. Although Spain failed to conquer Great Britain in the 16th century, the country remained an important world power as money poured in from the New World, fueling an artistic boom. King Philip II, and indeed many of the Habsburg kings, were great patrons of art, and this era became an age of cultural brilliance described as the Spanish Golden Age. Some of Spain's greatest artists and writers, such as the great Baroque painter Diego Velázquez and Miguel de Cervantes, the author of Don Quixote, found their place in the history of Madrid during this time, and their statues in other areas of the city reveal how very important they've become as part of Spanish heritage. A square which would have been very popular indeed during the Spanish Golden Age and which is considered to be the epitome of Habsburg Madrid stands just 200 metres east of the Plaza de la Villa and is probably one of the most famous squares in the city. Plaza Mayor was built during the reign of King Philip III, who sits proudly astride his horse in the centre of the square, overseeing the commuters hurrying by. The statue was designed in 1616 by two famous Italian artists, Giovanni di Bologna and his apprentice Pietro Tacca, and was moved here in the 19th century to complete the design of the plaza. The lampposts that surround the statue depict life in the square in days gone by, and you'll spot such scenes as bullfights, a masquerade ball, and one of the darker aspects in the history of Madrid, interrogations by the Spanish Inquisition. The Spanish Inquisition was established in 1478 to root out, suppress, and punish heretics, and ensured that the Catholic faith dominated Spanish culture for many centuries. Plaza Mayor, in fact, became a popular place for public trials by the Inquisition. And if found guilty, the victims would face torture or execution. Fortunately, the Spanish Inquisition was dissolved by the 18th century, and today you'll find the gorier aspects of Plaza Mayor's past are long forgotten. There are plenty of lovely sights to take in here, and the square is surrounded by wonderful historical buildings. One of the most impressive of these must be the Casa della Panaderia, which has a facade adorned with beautiful figurative paintings. From the architectural treasures overlooking the square, to the array of wonderful little bars and cafes that surround it, this has become one of the most pleasant areas in the city. But now it's time to move on to a different part of Madrid, and a short walk to the west will take us to one of the city's most prized possessions. When, in 1561, King Philip II decided that the imperial court should be based in Madrid, there was one building, essential for any capital city which was missing, a cathedral. Designs were hurriedly drawn up, so construction could begin. But it wasn't until over 400 years later that the Cathedral de Almudena, with its impressive neo-Gothic grey and white facade, was completed. Political problems, war and turbulence delayed construction, which didn't even begin until the 19th century. But finally, the cathedral dedicated to the patron saint of Madrid, the Virgin Almudena, was inaugurated by the Pope in 1993, but as you can see, the result has certainly been worth waiting for. There is, however, fierce competition from another of the city's most spectacular buildings, which stands across the square from the cathedral and reveals the influence of the French on the Spanish capital. The Palacio Real 
was built by the first Bourbon King of Spain, Philippe V, who hailed from France and modelled Madrid's royal palace on the Great Palace of Versailles, which stands outside Paris. The new king ordered the construction of the Palacio Real after an earlier version was destroyed by fire on Christmas Eve in 1734 and was adamant that his palace should be the greatest in the entire world. It was eventually completed in 1755 and even to this day it remains the largest palace in Western Europe. The line of Bourbon kings has survived into the 21st century Palacio Real remains the official residence of Spain's royal family, although they are rarely at home, preferring a smaller place on the outskirts of Madrid when not attending state occasions. This leaves members of the public at liberty to explore a great many of the palace's 3,000 rooms and experience the pure opulence once enjoyed by Spanish royalty. On the east side of the palace, you'll find another of Madrid's many stunning plazas, the Plaza de Oriente, which was once an area where crowds could gather to see kings, queens or dictators making their public appearances from the palace balcony. Complete with an elegant semicircular design, glorious trees and impressive statues of Spanish royalty, today this is an enchanting space could wander amongst the hedgerows and soak up the atmosphere of days gone by. You can also find a later addition to the area here, which was built during the reign of Queen Isabel II in the 19th century. The Teatro Real is considered one of the finest stages in the world for opera, and visiting is a must for music lovers. If you prefer to stay outside in the sun, however, you'll find that on the streets of Madrid, entertainment is never far away. The Palacio and Teatro Real have given us a taste of what the Bourbon kings and queens brought to Madrid, which you'll soon find that constructing royal palaces, theatres and gardens was just a small part of their contribution to the city. Under the reign of Carlos III in the 18th century, the capital began to take on a much grander appearance as Madrid was expanded and embellished and many of the elaborate fountains, promenades and impressive monuments you can find all around the city today are the result of his new vision for the capital. One of the city's most famous landmarks, the Plaza de Cibeles, was constructed during the reign of King Carlos. And just as the Colosseum is synonymous with Rome and the Eiffel Tower with Paris, this busy junction now epitomizes Madrid. The square takes its name from the beautiful fountain that stands at its centre, which is a wonderful depiction of the Greco-Roman goddess of nature, Cibela, being pulled in her chariot by two enormous lions. Surrounding the fountain and all around the plaza, you'll find many impressive landmarks built in a much later era. One which cannot fail to draw the eye is the Palacio de Comunicaciones. The locals humorously refer to this building as Our Lady of Communications because, despite illusions of grandeur and all the style of a magnificent church, it was Madrid's post office for many years, although it's since become home to the city council. This architectural masterpiece was completed in 1909 and designed by Antonio Palacios, who's been responsible for many other beautiful structures across the city. Opposite the Palacio de Comunicaciones, on the other side of the square, you'll find a slightly earlier building by Palacios, which dates back to 1918. While the architect created a palace to house the city post office, this beautiful structure is home to none other than the City Bank, Banco de España. The Plaza de Cibeles and the 
buildings that surround it are only a small part of the designs that Carlos III had for the Grande Madrid, however. And if you turn south, you'll find a beautiful boulevard adorned with elegant lampposts, flower beds and fountains called the Paseo del Prado, which has become a favourite haunt for visitors to the city. This lovely tree-lined walkway was once an idyllic district of market gardens known as the Meadow, but is today one of the most sophisticated streets in Madrid, which explains why it's so popular with locals and tourists alike. Initially, the walkway was to be surrounded by buildings dedicated to the study of science, but eventually the study of art would have the greater influence on the Paseo del Prado. In fact, amongst the cultural locations that can be found all along the boulevard, three art museums make up what has since become regarded as the Golden Triangle of Art. The most famous of these is, without doubt, the Prado Museum, which is renowned for housing the greatest collection of European art from the 12th century right through to the 19th century. And when you come face to face with the impressive facade, you'll immediately appreciate just how special this place is. Because the Prado has such a huge collection of art, the museum has had to constantly grow to accommodate all the treasures, and they're still in the process of building new wings today. Along with all the new rooms, there are also new entrances, the most famous and impressive of which is the Velázquez entrance, you'll find a beautiful sculpture of the great Spanish painter himself. If you have time to brave the queues, once inside you'll find some of the most stunning examples of Spanish art, including paintings by Goya and Velázquez and a great deal more besides. To the south of the Prado Museum, you'll find a more modern collection of artwork at the Centro de Arte Reina Sofia. This has been created in Madrid's former General Hospital, which was originally built in the late 18th century and is named after Queen Sofia, who inaugurated the museum in 1990. From famous work by Picasso, most notably Guernica, to surrealist masterpieces by Miro, the Sofia Gallery really is quite remarkable even those who are not fans of modern art can still appreciate the importance of this very special museum. The last of the three art museums that form the Golden Triangle is the Museo Thyssen Bornemisza, which is the most recent addition to the trio. This houses paintings illustrating the history of Western art and has become a much treasured addition to the area. Other than art museums, you'll also find plenty of other interesting sites along the Paseo del Prado, including the Botanical Gardens, a Naval Museum and Madrid Stock Exchange. While the Paseo del Prado became the pride and joy of Carlos III's reign, during the 19th century a more modern city would begin to take shape as Madrid's burgeoning middle classes began to push the city's limits outwards. A new thoroughfare was created, which has since become a symbol of the more contemporary Madrid, and today Gran Via, which leads out of Plaza de Cibeles, is not only famous for its lively atmosphere, cinemas and theatres, but also for the fine examples of 20th century Spanish architecture. The street is filled with lavish buildings, which demonstrate all manner of interesting and arresting designs. And if you happen to be exploring by night, you'll 
find that one structure in particular draws the eye more than any other. The unmistakable Telefonica building owes much to the early classic skyscrapers of New York and was, in fact, designed by the American architect Louis S. Weeks, although officially the credit for chief architect had to be given to the Spaniard Ignacio de Cadenas in order for planning permission to be secured. After dark, the city below buzzes with energy as the Spanish take time out to enjoy the evening attractions along Gran Via. And as shopping districts go, this wide, luxurious avenue is as fabulous as anything you would find in Paris or New York. Nearby, you'll also find another of the city's most famous landmarks, Puerta del Sol, the gateway to the sun, which marks the site of the original eastern entrance to Madrid and is today watched over by an equestrian statue of the king who made such an impact on the city, Carlos III. Having experienced the energy and fast-paced excitement of Madrid's nightlife, a little peace and tranquility will be no bad thing. And one of the last areas we'll explore on our tour through the city is the perfect place to relax and recharge your batteries. The Buen Retiro Park is a tranquil haven, which lies to the west of the Paseo del Prado, and one of 18 grand entrances that provide visitors with access to the park is the Independence Gate, with its fine columns and imposing ironwork. Visitors who enter the park for the first time are probably best advised to consult a map, as this inner city oasis covers a staggering 350 acres. To start our tour of the park, we'll begin in one of its more peaceful spots, the Palacio del Cristal, which has been gracing this space since 1887. Inspired by the Crystal Palace in London, which sadly didn't manage to stand the test of time after burning down in 1936, Madrid's gloriously intact version has views over a picturesque lake surrounded by trees and is a great introduction to the park. have time, you can explore the many paths and trails that lead off into this wonderful green space, or simply sit back and take in the views. The building itself, despite being well over a hundred years old, sparkles like new. And with its shimmering glass panels and beautifully arched roof, this is one of Madrid's brightest treasures and well worth seeking out. The Retiro Park is without doubt one of the world's most graceful and well-managed inner-city parks, and situated towards the southeastern end is the Rosalida or Rose Garden. This beautifully designed garden with water features, sculpted hedges and arches has been here since 1915, and within you'll find well over 4,000 roses, representing in excess of 1,000 different varieties. Sadly, our time exploring not only this intriguing park, but also the city of Madrid is now drawing to a close. But we couldn't possibly leave without visiting the park's most memorable attraction. The Alfonso Monument, overlooking the park's wonderful boating lake, is truly magnificent and was constructed early in the 20th century. Alfonso, proudly astride his horse at the very top of the monument, looks over the proceedings and complete with a semicircular colonnade below, this really is one of Madrid's most beautiful and more tranquil locations. And if there's time, hiring a boat and taking to the water is the perfect way to soak up the sun and take in this last stunning view of the city. Madrid will, as time goes by, become ever more popular, as there is just so much to see and do here. And hopefully, as we really have reached our journey's end, you'll be inspired to visit the city in person and experience the delights of the Spanish capital for yourself. Whether you're looking for enlightening museums, fabulous architecture, designer shops, 
or simply beautiful public parks in which to while away the hours, Madrid can offer all of these treasures and a great deal more besides.